chronic hepatitis and vaccination. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sai, uh, who is uh, my mentor in hepatology. I am so excited to have him on. Uh, Dr. Sai uh, completed his medical school training in uh, Taipei Medical, U medical University in Taiwan. He has uh, um, done his internal medicine residency at Yale University and the fellowship in gastroenterology and hepatology fellowship in the State University of New York in Buffalo. Uh, Dr. Sai's name is uh, synonymous with hepatology and uh, liver diseases in Hawaii. He has been instrumental uh, in uh, establishing the first transplant program uh, in Hawaii, the first liver center in Hawaii. And uh, he is generally the person that everybody reaches out to when they have questions uh, uh, in um, hepatology. Uh, Dr. Sai is uh, extensively published and has participated in multiple, multiple clinical trials in uh, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, as well as fatty liver disease. And certainly most important contribution of Dr. Sai's that I consider is uh, training and inspiring uh, multiple people to go into medicine, uh, gastroenterology and hepatology. Dr. Sai, take it away. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Marina, that uh, is uh, very generous. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I want to thank the organization and Dr. Holt uh, for inviting me and, and of course Marina to uh, participate in this very interesting uh, symposiums. And uh, I will say aloha uh, because uh, I see everybody wearing very heavy jackets and I'm on a uh, aloha shirt. And it is always very difficult to uh, present right after Mindy because she's always have so much information and so clearly presented. So I hope I can uh, follow up with a little bit more uh, efforts uh, to keep up with the pace. Okay, so this is my uh, conflict of interest. As uh, Marina have already mentioned, uh, that my topic will be on the non serotic hepatitis, which is basically hepatitis A and hepatitis E. Uh, and I will describe the shifting demographics and the new clinical manifestation of both uh, virus. And I also need to talk about the vaccination for both hepatitis A and B. And so here is our, uh, here's, here's our, our objective. Now I show this cartoon, just want to be sure that after my presentation today, uh, you don't get too paranoid about certain things that uh, I presented today. Now, as you can see here that there are five uh, virus that is targeted uh, liver as the co uh, a target organ uh, from A to E. We'll be talking about A and E initially. And as you can see that both uh, A and E are RNA virus and they have pretty much similar genome size about seven and a half KB and both of them don't have envelope. So it's very similar uh, between these two virus. And hepatitis A virus is a uh, transmission through uh, fecal oral, uh, which is very typical presentation uh, for hepatitis A. Although uh, there are some report of uh, blood transfusions. Uh, in fact, that uh, the first uh, episode that I encountered was in Hawaii where a dermatologist from Chicago uh, came to Hawaii for a vacation and donated his blood when he arrives as a good citizen. That pint of blood was transmitted to a, transfused to a newborn baby in our uh, women's hospitals. And the baby got infected and the whole units of nurses got infected. At the end of the day is almost uh, 50 or 60 uh, adult got infected with uh, symptomatic uh, hepatitis A. So that is still uh, something that would occur. Uh, the hepatitis A had one, geno uh, one serotype and several uh, genotypes, and there are three structural proteins, one single immunodominant uh, neutralizing antibody site. So this is where the hepatitis A vaccine is targeted. It can be replicating cytoplasms and propagate slowly in human and non-human primate cell lines. 
the clinical variants or clinical presentations of hepatitis A are basically two type, oops, uh, asymptomatic or anoteric disease, which usually occur in kids, uh, particularly newborn to uh, age six, uh, have more than 90% of them does not have symptoms. And that is usually what we see in clinics where you see someone coming from endemic area, uh, such as Southeast Asia, they don't usually recall that they have been uh, uh, infected with hepatitis A. Whereas if the infection occur in adult or the adolescent age, there are much higher percentage of them would present it with uh, icteric hepatitis. And that's what we see here in the United States. Now, for those who are symptomatic, there are three different clinical variants that has been described. A cholesterol hepatitis, which is the most typical presentations. There's some small percentage of patients would have relapsing hepatitis that usually lasted uh, up to about one year, and then they would dissipate eventually. And the most dreadful uh, presentation is fulminant liver failures. Uh, we see them, and mostly uh, the patients that fall into this category had chronic liver disease to start with. And, and many of them may have underlying advanced fibrosis or even cirrhosis. And so that for them, uh, the uh, clinical course is worse uh, in this setting. Now, the demographic changes in the United States has been uh, quite interesting because in the last two, three years, uh, the uh, incidence of acute hepatitis A has been increasing. This is according to the CDC report. Uh, and in 2008, there was a shot up of the incidence of hepatitis A. Now, most of this hepatitis A reporting are in the middle America, uh, uh, in, in the area where if you uh, recognize it, it's pretty much where the increase in hepatitis, acute hepatitis C infections, where narcotic epidemic is located. And that's where you see them most concentrated report of hepatitis A infections. And if you look at this uh, analysis further by CDC, most of these new cases were among uh, patients whose age is between 20 to 50 years of age. And mostly in non-Hispanic whites, mostly in the suburban whites. And a lot of them has to do with uh, drug usage, and they affect both uh, men and women. And the death rate also increased in general about two and a half folds from 2014 to 2018. And these are the risk factor analysis uh, by the CDC. And as you can see, the highest uh, rate were in those IV drug usage, PWIDs. And, and to a surprise that we used to see mostly the international travelers uh, has actually become less frequent uh, as people are being vaccinated. So the CDC has recommended the following population that uh, should be vaccinated for hepatitis A. Uh, the pediatricians has actually taken the uh, proactive way several years ago after uh, quite a lot of uh, you know, uh, persuasions finally adopted hepatitis A vaccine as part of their vaccine strategy. So between age 12 to 23, uh, they were a month, uh, they were uh, vaccinated. And the unvaccinated children that was either adopted or the adolescents, bet adolescents between two and 18 years has been uh, advised to have a catch up uh, hepatitis A vaccinations. Of course, international travelers, Men have sex with men, people who have uh, a PW, PWID or PWUDs uh, was advised to have. And then uh, of course, uh, people who have occupational risk for infections uh, and also the international adoptees family uh, should be uh, uh, considered for hepatitis A vaccines. And in the, la in the last few years, there is an increased awareness of the shelterless uh, populations and a case in point is uh, San Diego City where you had a huge pandemic or endemic occur in the uh, shelterless uh, populations. And mostly have to do with the hygiene. Patient with HIV, chronic liver diseases, you know, as we all use in our practice to, uh, to uh, vaccinate these people. 
and, and virtually anybody who wants to have uh, uh, immunity, you probably can offer them. The good thing about the A vaccine is that the efficacy is pretty good, uh, reported up to 15 years of protections, and, and this may be lifelong, and there is no need for booster uh, vaccinations uh, after the initial uh, shots. There is two type of uh, prophylaxis. One is uh, passive uh, prophylaxis with uh, human immune globulin. These are people who are in a short notice has to go to endemic area. And the current practice uh, report, I mean, uh, advocated by uh, CDC for prof, uh, expo uh, pre exposure prophylaxis are uh, shown in here. And this all depends on how long they have to stay in the endemic area. And typically the dose increase if it's more, uh, up to two months. And if more than two months, they were advocated to be uh, vaccinated uh, every two months uh, after uh, the initial vaccination. I, I suspect that these people who are anticipated to stay longer probably should have an active vaccination at the same time so that they don't have to worry about continuing uh, passive immunizations. And for post uh, exposure of prophylaxis, it should be done within two weeks and the dosage is shown in here. The active prophylaxis uh, in the United States, there is two hep A vaccines uh, shown in here. There were two dosage from uh, time zero to time six up to the 12 months for the uh, Hoverix and the other one is up to six to 18 months that can be given of, of the second, uh, second shot. The dose is a little bit different, uh, depends on their age. And there are Trinrix, which is a uh, Hep A and Hep B combination uh, vaccination for those who are not exposed to either of them. Now let's go on to Hepatitis E, which I think has more interesting uh, Informations that we know how we see. And as I mentioned, that the size of the hepatitis E is about 7.5 kilobase, and uh, they have three open reading frames. Again, no envelope. The antibody to uh, ORF2 derived proteins are neutralizing. And I think this is where the target for the vaccine for hepatitis E that has been developed in China. And apparently had pretty good protection up to 95%, according to their report. It is FDA, their FDA approved in China. It has been also used in some uh, area. Uh, one of them were Napoli's army uh, that were used to protect these uh, populations. And there is no cell culture system for Hep E, and they infect a human hepatocytes and primates hepatocytes. The, uh, the serology for Hep E are basically antibody IgM and IgG. And the, the problem with the serology test in the United States and the same as the virology test is that we don't have an FDA approved uh, methodology and therefore it's not standardized. In the last few years, I believe the WHO has been starting try to do uh, standardization internationally for both the serology testing and the uh, uh, nucleic acid testing. Uh, it's easier nowadays to obtain the antibody testing, but not as easy to get a hep E RNA testing. And I hope in the next few years, this will become more uh, available commercially. And the transmissions uh, for hepatitis E uh, traditionally known to be fecal oral. These are usually relating to the waterborne infection in the developing world. However, in the last few years, uh, zoonotic infections or transmission is getting noticed, uh, usually through undercooked or uh, uh, uncooked meat. Uh, the initial report is from pork, but also uh, many reports has been uh, published regarding other game meat. Uh, so uh, these are uh, uh, one of the common uh, transmission for hepatitis E in the developed world. And they also uh, increasing concern about possible transfusion transmitted <clears throat> hepatitis E. And I'll show you some data on the blood bank uh, donated blood testing for nucleic acid 
mostly in Europe and some in the US. The incubation period is 15 to 60 days. The mortality rate is usually less than 1% unless a pregnant woman in the third trimester got infected. The mortality rate can go up to 30%. Uh, the reason behind it is not quite clearly understood, but uh, we know that pregnant women tends to have increased steroid hormone, which is uh, immune inhibitory, and that is considered or suggested as possible reason for fulminant uh, liver disease. But also, uh, it seems to be only genotype one hepatitis E have been reported most. Although in last few years, uh, Japanese have reported uh, their genotype four uh, do cause pregnant women to have significant disease. And the new uh, understanding about hepatitis E is that it does cause chronic hepatitis E in particularly immunosuppressive persons, including those who are on chemotherapy uh, or uh, of, uh, especially in my field, the solid organ transplant. And the preventions are mostly hygiene uh, and the vaccine hopefully uh, may become available uh, and which has been uh, quite successfully used in China. And also uh, blood uh, nucleic acid uh, screening, which has uh, uh, created a lot of debate. And I understand that UK's blood uh, safety board has actually endorsed uh, that uh, this nucleic acid test for all the blood products for those patients who are receiving uh, transplantations. And the treatment is mostly supportive. Uh, however, uh, there are reports of using rubber variant uh, uh, with some success. And there is also uh, uh, uses of microphenolate, mostly in the uh, transplant patients where this agent has been shown to have uh, ability in vitro to prohibit uh, hepatitis E replications. And this is the epidemiologies of hepatitis E around the globe. You can see uh, the different color indicate different uh, uh, endemic area. The brown colors are the high endemic area. The uh, lighter brown colors are the uh, uh, medium and the uh, light yellow is uh, low. Now it's, it's been estimated about 20 million people have hepatitis E infection, work worry and about 3.3 million people uh, presented uh, symptomatically. So what is the symptom, the illness? The usually acute self-limiting and resolve just like other uh, acute hepatitis, such as hep hepatitis A. And, but there are many are asymptomatic uh, or they can cause acute hepatitis manifested with jaundice. And this seems to be following the pattern of hepatitis A also, that the younger they get, the least they become symptomatic. Uh, it's kind of paradoxical, but uh, the uh, experience suggests that this may have to do with the immune systems uh, differences between the young and the uh, adult uh, populations. They can lead to liver failure, uh, particularly in pregnant women, or in those patients who have uh, chronic liver disease, so-called acute or chronic uh, infections. And in, in immune suppressed patients, in particular solid organ transplant patients, chronic hepatitis E has been reported uh, since early 2010s. There are eight genotypes uh, as of today. Uh, and the most common one were genotype one and two, which is usually in the tropics and uh, uh, developing world. The genotypes three and four are mostly in uh, developed worlds. Uh, and uh, um, the transmission modes is different between these two. One is waterborne and the other one is zoonotic. Uh, and the genotype five, six and the seven, eight was only isolated in animal. So far, there is no human disease reported. Uh, in case you wonder what is zoometry and the Bactrian camels, one is in Arab, uh, Arabic, and the other one is, uh, where's the other one? Uh, there's a two different uh, camels. One have one hump and the other one have two humps. And between the Bactrian camel is two humps. 
And this is the uh, information I just want to show you of the uh, concern about blood uh, you know, contaminants with hepatitis E. They're doing this uh, all uh, DNA studies, but uh, I'm sorry, RNA uh, studies from different countries. And they actually pull the uh, blood for uh, uh, testing and the samples are pretty big. And these are the results from nothing to all the way to one in 14, 1440s. And so uh, <clears throat> these are the <clears throat> concerns that's raised uh, and debated about should we start to screen uh, blood, uh, at least for those patients who have, uh, who are going undergoing a solid organ transmissions. And in fact, U UK has actually uh, published that uh, policy. How do we make diagnosis? Uh, of course, we for acute hepatitis, IgM, antibody is the uh, diagnosis we use. And in uh, patients uh, who have positive uh, IgM anti uh, hepatitis E, uh, you probably can make the diagnosis of acute effect, uh, hep B infections. The RNA test is important for those uh, who are immunosuppressed because sometimes the antibody would not be produced uh, in those immunosuppressive uh, uh, patients. The problem is that we don't really have uh, widely available uh, viremia, I mean, uh, uh, HCV, uh, HEV RNA testing. And so uh, there is a study um, in uh, patients who have acute liver failure, particularly suspicions of drug-induced liver injury, I think was published by Dr. Devon. Uh, representing the uh, network, clinical network work for acute liver failure. They have identified many of the reported drug to reduce induced liver uh, failure patients have actually have hepatitis E infections. And of course, uh, someone who is uh, immunosuppressed either on chemotherapy or uh, had solid organ transplant, uh, if they presented with chronic liver disease, Hepatitis C infection should be part of the differential diagnosis. There are reports of extra hepatic manifestations, uh, uh, and they are mostly likelihood or possible, uh, and some of them are probably not uh, likely, but most reported were uh, related to genotype 3 with neurological myotrophy, Guillain Barre syndromes, pancreatitis, and glomerulonephritis, among other things. So the treatment, this is a study uh, that was reported back in 2016. It was a small study uh, and it's a retrospective analysis which uh, several centers pulled together. They were actually looking at all immunosuppressed agent, uh, patients with autoimmune disease, chemotherapy patient and age more than 70. And they treated them, they are, these are all RNA positive patients and they were using uh, 600 to 800 milligram of ribavirin for up to three months. And they were a, uh, RNA positive at the outset in about uh, uh, 26, uh, three to four weeks there uh, later, all of them turned negative, uh, but there's no long-term follow-up uh, in this group of patients. And in their study, two uh, person died from uh, hepatitis Z related and one uh, relapsed after the clearance. So this has been uh, re, you know, uh, recommended through several review paper, as you can see uh, down here, uh, all the three different review paper, which I think is quite uh, uh, comprehensive. And there are four questions they presented and provide some answer to it. And the first question is which patient should be tested for uh, hepatitis E? And they think anybody who come in with acute liver injury or a patient who have chronically elevation of immunosuppressive agents, or a patient you suspect acute liver failure could be from the drug-induced liver injury, which is by definition is a rule out a diagnosis, always check for hepatitis E. Now, who should we test for HEV? I think that's, uh, how should we treat a test for HEV, the IgM antibody or uh, SCB RNA if it is available? particularly in patients with uh, immunosuppressed because sometimes they do not uh, produce antibodies. How long should one treat Hep E with ribavirin for? I think three months was kind of set 
by most people. And I, I want to be sure to mention that this is not FDA approved. And for those patients who are immunosuppressed, you know, particularly in solid organ transplant recipient, the first thing you should do <coughs> is to reduce, <coughs> excuse me, is to reduce the immunosuppressive regimens. It has been known that the CNI, cyclosporine A and mTOR inhibitors, tends to uh, stimulate uh, reproductions of the hepatitis E virus, and the uh, microphenolate uh, seems to suppress it. So uh, if you either reduce the dosage or change of the immunosuppression, that probably would help uh, this chronic infection with hepatitis E and then sometimes to use uh, with ribavirin. There was some anecdotal report of using sulfosavir, uh, the one that uh, was used for uh, hepatitis C. Uh, very uh, conflicting reports, some effective, some are not, and the numbers are very small. A lot of them were case reports, so it's not really uh, been uh, uh, critically evaluated for those agents. But, but quite clearly for this group of patients, some kind of a more uh, effective antiviral agent may be needed. And if you fail ribavirin treatments, I think the recommendation is extend them to six months. And uh, if they are not renal transplant recipients, a consideration for pegylated interferon. And I want to explain why it's so aggressive in terms of treating this particular group of uh, patients is because they are report of very aggressive liver disease and ends up with cirrhosis and needing for a retransplant been reported. So in some cases, this could be quite serious with the serious consequences. Now we get to the last section with hepatitis B vaccinations. Uh, the target of the B vaccine is uh, a certain, the small uh, service proteins as shown in here. And the uh, recommendation for uh, hepatitis B vaccines uh, in the primary care settings, medical diagnosis, particularly diabetics age 15 to 59, this was added in the last few years. And anybody who have chronic liver disease, HIV infections, and end-stage renal disease uh, with or without dialysis. Sexual exposures, we all know about that. Occupational risk and other uh, uh, risk factors such as uh, uh, IV drug users, household contacts of the patients. And I also noticed that in a very recent past, the uh, US uh, Preventive Service uh, Task Force has come forward with the recommendations, at least in the uh, commentary uh, period that they were looking into uh, having a universal screening for hepatitis B a certain age group. Uh, we know we already know that the pregnant woman need to be uh, screened. So this is a step further uh, that the universal screening for hepatitis B may become a reality. The current vaccines for hepatitis B in the United States, there are uh, both, uh, all of them were recombinant. There are two types. One is alum suspension and the other one is adjuvanted solutions. Uh, as shown in here, uh, the alum suspension is uh, three shots and the adjuvanted solution is two shots one month apart. And of course, there are combination vaccines for pediatrics group and also for both A and B vaccination that we have mentioned earlier. Now, the uh, concern about is the response rate with the uh, traditional three shots uh, hepatitis B vaccination, in particularly older population, older uh, age uh, group, and shown the serum protection is only about 75% uh, of patients, uh, persons who are age 60s and older. Uh, patient with diabetes, either children or adults, uh, particularly in adults, the protection is lower, and the immunocompromised uh, populations. So with this in mind, uh, a adjuvanted uh, recombinant uh, vaccine has been uh, uh, approved by FDA in November. And what the difference is that in instead of using alum solutions, uh, they were adding a uh, TL TLR9 uh, receptor agonist to stimulate immune receptors. 
and to improve the immunogenicity of the hepatitis B vaccines. And this is uh, a slide that was provided to me by Dr. Robert Walker, who uh, worked for the company, and I think it's useful, uh, in particular, uh, those patients who have uh, diabetes and other uh, low responsive populations. And this is a big number. Uh, this is particularly patient with diabetes, uh, which uh, they were looking at how good is their uh, seroprotections are. They also look at other group uh, in the uh, entire uh, populations. And you can see that the adjuvanted vaccine produced 90% uh, in contrast to a 65.1% for those patients with diabetes. They are looking at the gender differences, the age differences, obesities, and the smokers, and there were some improvements uh, in that sense. And interesting that there is a, a re, I'm sorry, oops, uh, a recent, a very recent report uh, from CDC researchers. This is uh, published in Vaccines it's online. Uh, they were uh, looking at the cost utility comparisons of the adjuvanted vaccines and the non-adjuvanted uh, vaccines. Uh, and they were using a decision tree model and a Markov disease progression process to look at this uh, question they have. They study uh, <clears throat> populations who have diabetes, obesity, chronic kidney disease, HIV, and those non responder to the previous vaccinations and uh, patients, uh, pa uh, uh, people who are older, uh, uh, more than 65 years of age, and PWID populations. The database, the population database, are from Enhanced Database, from HIV Surveillance Database, and the National Survey uh, on Drug Use and Health, uh, those big database. And it is a very comprehensive analysis. Uh, which is going to be a very long time for uh, me, or uh, maybe I'm, I'm not even capable of going through those biostatistic analysis. But the conclusion they come down to is that they found the adjuvanted vaccines seem to have a lower cost with increased benefit in all the population that they have looked at, except those patients who have no response to the previous hepatitis B vaccinations. So with that, I think that's my, oh, there's last slide here. Now with the uh, adjuvanted vaccines, uh, we know that the reactional, reactionality or the side effect would probably increase relating to increased uh, immunogenicities. So of course, uh, the safety issue is important uh, in this setting. So this is a, a study that they show in the same study that I, I showed earlier but their database is more than 14,000 patients comparing the two regimens. And if you look at all the uh, side effect reported, uh, there seems to be really quite similar in those two groups, which is kind of uh, comforting to know that even with the adjuvanted vaccines, the side effect is not increased. And, and that's the last of my question. I hope I do not go over my time. Thank you, Dr. Sai. That was very informative. Um, there is several um, questions. Um, the first question is, do you have a specific clinical threshold to use ribavirin in acute hepatitis E, or do we treat anyone who is sick with it? Or do we only use ribavirin for chronic hep E? Yes, I think we will use mostly for chronic hep, B, hep, C, uh, hep E, because you, most of the patients who have acute hep E unless in those pregnant women that I mentioned, uh, they usually recover. Uh, and so uh, it doesn't make sense to treat them with uh, ribavirin. We use it only when we were sort of desperate in those patients who are chronically infected and particularly affecting their graft. Uh, and this is also true in the uh, uh, kidney graft too, has been reported a loss of graft in both liver and kidney. So I, I, the answer to the question, yes, I would recommend to use only for chronic liver, uh, chronic hepatitis E in those particular settings. Got it, thank you. And then um, last question was um, the mycophenolate, can that inhibit chronic hep E? 
Um, that is interesting, seems counterintuitive. Would you not reduce the mycophenolate in a transplant recipient with chronic hep E? Uh, the reason for that uh, comment is because there are in vitro evidence that MMF do inhibit hepatitis C replications. And so uh, that was the theory behind that if you, after reducing the uh, CNIs or mTOR, uh, their disease seemed to be continued to progress, uh, replacements uh, with an MNF in appropriate situations seem to make sense. So that has been, uh, you know, recommended uh, in those review that the, that I show you. And so, of course, the first step you want to do is to reduce the immune suppression. But there's only a certain, uh, you know, uh, uh, reduction that you can do without jeopardizing the uh, graft. So that's when you want to add something that also have immunosuppressive effect, but have also been shown uh, to suppress the hepatitis E replications. Dr. Sai, one more question. Um, they're asking, I, I think, I believe it's a question. It's ribavirin safety in pregnancy? No. Yeah. Yeah, they, 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 is, uh, they have some uh, problem with the, um, uh, the fetus uh, deformity and others. So it is uh, not, it's contraindicated in pregnant women. That's a good point. And then in, in a patient, they also cause, you know, hemolysis. I think we all went through that. If all the people attending this meeting have experience with the pre-DAA the pre hepatitis C treatment, they would know what I meant. Got it. I think that was it, Dr. Sai. Yes, I just want to share this uh, last cartoon because uh, this guy's on Hawaii Islands. Uh, he, he's not drinking beer. He's drinking uh, colored and uh, flavor water. So we are very healthy people on this island. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sai. <laughs> I, I hope I don't get anybody paranoid about this, this virus, hepatitis E. <laughs> <laughs>